actually express so much, and in particular about the, the, the strength of who we are and the strength of our convictions. And, you know, I, it's interesting in this moment in time where we have these, you know, this, this strong man thing going on. Um, you know, strong women know that strength actually comes from lifting people up. Strength actually comes from feeling and caring and then being prepared to do what is necessary to protect and to support. And you are one of those incredible leaders and women, and I just thank you for hosting us thank and you. for everything you're doing with Emerge and for the endorsement. So can we please hear it for Susan? <laughs> By the way, Year of the Dragon. Yes, we are. <laughs> just, just, just so you know. <laughs> yes, we are. Okay, thank you so much for everything you do. I mean, in Greenville, being the chair of the Democratic Party and all the work that that requires and all the organizing that requires, and especially in these last couple of years, all that that requires in terms of inspiring people to know the fight is worth it. That's a big, heavy lift, and you are doing it with grace and with elegance and you make it look easy and I know it is not. So can we please hear it? And thank you all, everyone, for taking time out of your busy lives to be here. Um, I'm going to just, I'll share a few thoughts and things and then um, I really just want to hear from you and, and have a conversation. Um, but, you know, this is a women's event and, and with the men who love us and... Um, <laughs> And, you know, it's interesting, I just left a, 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 t a town hall, kind of a meet and greet um, that we did earlier in Anderson, and um, I was talking a bit about what it means to be a woman, and in particular, an elected woman. And so I shared with people, because as you've heard in my background, I was the first woman of one sort or another to do everything I've done. As DA, the first woman ever in San Francisco, as Attorney General of California, which is a state of 40 million people to be what is called the top cop of the biggest state, right, in the country, a first woman, and then in, in the United States second, to be the second black woman in the United States Senate. And so, as you all can imagine, um, during the course of my career, there have been journalists who often would come up to me with this very imaginative question. And they would put a microphone in front of me and they'd ask, well, what's it like to be the first woman X, right? And I would, I would say to them, you know, I'm not really sure how to answer that question because, you see, I've always been a woman. <laughs> but I'm sure a man could do the job just as well. <laughs> Great answer. And, and then, of course, there were many times where people would come up to me and say, well, talk to us about women's issues. And I'd look at them and I'd say, you know, I am so glad you want to talk about the economy. <laughs> Sometimes I've said national security. Sometimes I've said the climate crisis, right? And on and on and on. Because we know all issues are women's issues, and women's issues are everyone's issues. And you know, my perspective on these things has come obviously from living a life of being first a girl and then a woman, but. Um, <laughs> Also, I was raised by an incredible mother. My sister Maya is here. Maya, you'll wave. She's my camp. There she is in the back. She's also my campaign chair. And she and I were uh, raised as my mo my mother had two children, her two daughters, and um, and she was a phenomenal, phenomenal person. She was all of five feet tall, but if you had ever met her, you would have thought she was seven feet tall. <laughs> and she was ferocious. You know, my mother, um, she was a, a breast cancer researcher, a scientist, and she had two goals in her life, to raise her two daughters and end breast cancer. She would take us to the lab with her on the weekends and after work and after school. Um, little known fact, my first job was cleaning pipettes. Um, I was awful, she fired me. Um, but I remember our mother coming home 
sometimes just outraged because of what she witnessed and would see in terms of the inequities of how women are treated in terms of their health issues, how women are treated in the workplace. And so as a very young child growing up, I, it was just in my environment to always believe and know that we must continually be in the business of fighting for women's issues, for women's dignity, for women's place to belong, our mother was the kind of person, she would say to me, don't you ever let anyone tell you who you are. You tell them who you are. Mm -hmm. She was also the kind of parent that said, listen, you may be the first to do many things. She'd say that to me calmly. You may be the first to do many things, but make sure you're not the last. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's another thing. You know, people now that I've been running for, for office as president, uh, they've been saying, well, why are you running? Why are you running? And I, again, I refer to my mother. And I say, well, uh, my mother was the kind of parent that if you ever came home complaining about something, the first thing she'd do, sometimes maybe with a hand on a hip, was look at you and she'd say, well, what are you going to do about it? And so I decided to run for president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to share with you just a couple of things that I've been thinking and talking about. But really, I am here to listen. Because I will tell you, I fully expect and I fully intend to win this election. Um, but at the end of this process, at the end of this process, that will obviously be a measure of our success. But another equally important measure of our success will be that at the end of this process, we are relevant. And so I'm here to listen as much as I am to, as to talk, and then hopefully more to listen than to talk. But I'll share with you a couple of things I've been talking about recently. Um, one has to do with. Uh, the reality of women's health. And I know that Kate talked about it, we've talked about it some time this afternoon. Uh, you know, what's happening in Alabama? What's happening around our country? Listen, women's reproductive health and our access to reproductive health is under attack, a full-on attack in our country. And I know there are those of us who over the years have been really concerned at, you know, and troubled about why is this always the case? And I would say one thing, which is I, I often repeat and paraphrase advice that Coretta Scott King gave us, where she famously said, and I'll paraphrase, the fight for civil rights, and you can insert in there the fight for justice, the fight for equality, the fight for civil rights must be fought and won with each generation. That was her advice, and that was her counsel. And it was an admonition, because I believe she had two points. One, it is the very nature of these fights that whatever gains we make, they will not be permanent. It's the nature of it. So the second part of that admonition then is, knowing that, do not despair. Do not be overwhelmed. Let's not throw up our hands when it's time to roll up our sleeves. The way I think about it is really simple. Like your nails grow, you go, oh my god, my nails are growing. You just cut them, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we know this fight for women's reproductive health and choice is in that context. Whatever gains we make, they will not be permanent. We must be vigilant. And so this is yet another example, this moment in time. And we are up for it. And we will fight. And we will fight. And I'm going to tell you, though, I'll tell you what I'm prepared to do. Because, you know, as a, you know, I was the top lawyer of the state of California, 40 million people also. And I know the power of the courts. My parents met when they were active in the civil rights movement. The heroes, among the heroes in that movement were the lawyers, Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston and Constance Baker Motley. They understood the power of a lawyer to argue for people's rights in courts. Well, let me tell you, that's why I became a lawyer. That's why I became a prosecutor. And as president of the United States, on this issue of women's access to reproductive health and choice, I am prepared to require the Department of Justice, under my leadership, the United States Department of Justice, to require that they review the laws passed by any state that has a history of passing laws 
to restrict a woman's access to reproductive health. And they must review those laws to determine the constitutionality. And until there is a clean bill that it passes constitutional muster, that law will not be allowed to take effect. in the states, it's where this is happening. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we've been worried about overturning Roe v. Wade, but equally, it's about states mm -hmm. individually putting up restrictions on access to the point then that there is virtually no right. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that is, is the slow burn on this. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, yes, we play defense, but let's also play offense. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm prepared to say there has to be pre-parents for any state that has a history of impeding a woman's access, that they have to be cleared through the Department of Justice and my Department of Justice. Women's issues. Well, let's talk about the reality of what we all know. We've been talking about it since 19, I think it's 64, when we talked about the Equal Pay Act. In America today, as it has been for decades, Women are not paid equal to men for equal work. So right now the numbers are, women are paid on average 80 cents on the dollar. Black women, 61 cents. Native American women, 58 cents. Latinas, 53 cents. So this is another one of those subjects where I'm just kind of done. <laughs> because it's not a debatable point. Like, this is the thing about this issue. It's actually not a debatable point. Those numbers are real. So, and we've been talking about these numbers forever, right? And we've seen very little change. I mean, thank God that we had President Obama, who, as his first act, signed the Lilly Ledbetter Act. Remember that? Lilly Ledbetter, that incredible, you know, there's press here, badass woman. Who <laughs> <laughs> pushed through and litigated and litigated, and, that, and therefore the act was named after her to say women have a right to sue on these issues. Well, you know, the way I think about it, I was kind of raised that, you know, the, the question for each of us in our life and the meaning of our life and what our God will ask us is, it's a, it was a relay race. And during your time, you were given a baton. And what'd you do when you had that baton? So here's what I'm prepared to do when I get the baton. I'm prepared to say that on this issue of pay equity based on gender, that instead of requiring a woman to prove that she is not making the same amount of money as someone who is, com who is completing or performing the same work, right? And how does that come up? Just think about it, everyday things, right? She's sitting next to her in the cubicle next to the person working next to her, her, her male colleague. Then maybe they're at the water cooler on the elevator talking about, oh, what are you doing for your kids for Christmas? And then they start having a conversation and it becomes clear to her, oh, he's kind of buying things for his kids that I can't afford for mine. <laughs> hmm. So she's thinking, that this doesn't sound right. Let me go and talk to the supervisor. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking supervisor, are, are we making the same amount? How much is he making? Oh, I can't tell you how much people are paid. So then what happens? She has to go to the EEOC of the, the agency, right, the Equal Employment Opportunity Division of the, of, the, of the agency or the corporation. And they say, well, you know, you're gonna have to give us more information. So she's gotta do her own investigation pretty much, right? Or maybe she can come out of pocket, because that's the only way it's gonna happen, to get a lawyer to litigate the issue. Well, I'm saying enough of that. Enough is enough. It's time to shift the burden away from that working woman and onto the big corporations. So instead of her having to prove she's not being paid as much as the guy who sits next to her doing the same work, it's now the burden is going to shift to the corporations to prove they are paying people the same amount of money for the same work. And, that's how, and how this is going to work is that the burden will shift, and they will then have to do an analysis of how much they're paying people for comparable work. And they will have to publish that on their website. And they will have to be certified as paying the people the same amount or not. You know, like you know, in some places you go to restaurants with like A, B, or C rating? 
right? And so when you're applying for the job, you might just decide, I'm going to walk right by that B and C. I'll go to the A, right? Yes. yes. Shift the burden. We're going to shift the burden also, and again, this might be my prosecutive background, where there's also going to be a consequence for failure to do the right thing, which will be this. For every 1% differential between paying men and women for equal work, there will be a 1% fine, which will be 1% of their profits from the year before. So 1% differential, you're going to have to pay as a fine 1% of your profits from the year before. 5% differential, you're going to have to pay 5% of your profits from the year before as a fine. And where are we going to put that money, you ask? Let me tell you where we're going to put it. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to put it into a fund for, get this, paid family leave. Yes. care of your family, but you actually get paid when you do the work of having to take care of your sick children or your senior parents who need a little extra support and help. Let's talk about all these issues. Let's talk about the issue of teachers. So true story, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Frances Wilson, God rest her soul, attended my law school graduation. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Here's the thing about that story. Many of us have a similar story of some teacher along the way who convinced us we were special. We weren't particularly special. <laughs> <laughs> but they told us we were special and we believed them, <laughs> which gave us the confidence to do the things that we're doing, which is now being under the same roof talking about who might be the next president of the United States. Yeah. Teachers. Well, in America today, first of all, 70% of our teachers are women. Mm -hmm. Teachers are paid on average 11% less than similarly educated professionals. Teachers, 94% of the teachers in public schools in America today come out of their own pocket to help pay for school supplies. I cannot tell you the number of teachers I have been meeting traveling this country who are working two, sometimes three jobs to pay the bills. And all of that to say we are not paying teachers their value. And we all know there are two groups of people raising our children. Parents, often with the assistance of grandparents and aunties and uncles, and our teachers but we are not paying them their value. So I am prepared to invest what will be the first in the nation's history federal investment in closing the teacher pay gap. And that will mean nationally a pay gap of $13,500 a year. Here in South Carolina, it's about $10,000 a year. And let's be clear about what that means. $10,000 a year is a year's worth of mortgage payments. $10,000 a year is a year's worth of grocery bills. $10,000 a year means putting a significant dent in student loan debt, which is one of the greatest barriers to our students coming out and going into the passion that they feel for teaching. Because with that debt and with that salary, they just simply can't afford to teach. And I'll put a fine point on this subject. I believe that you can and should judge a society based on how it treats its children. Yeah. And one of the greatest measures then of a society's love for its children is to invest in their education and by extension, their teachers. So these are some of the issues that I am thinking about and talking about and for which I believe we've got some solutions. Um, there are many more, and I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has, but I would love to start our conversation. But I'll just close my comments by again saying thank you. Um, I cannot do this by myself. And yes, I fully intend to win, and I will need your help. And so I thank you for your time and your attention, and I hope to earn your support. So thank you all very much.
have questions. So, but I think the center only is going to have time for a few, and then because she wants to actually meet you guys instead of just talking at <laughs> yes. you guys. So I know we had one in specific that was sent to us from two high school sophomores who could not be here today because oh, they're taking final exams. Oh. <laughs> um, my name is Sarah McHenry. My grade is Sarah McHenry. My daughter Molly is a sophomore at public high school here in town, and so she wanted me to ask uh, she and her friends. Um, said it was about control. Yes. And so yeah. school shootings are concerned they live with things. Yeah. Yeah. And Grand County Schools has a policy of suspending students who take part in walkouts. Um, hmm. And my daughter and her friends aren't going to be quite old enough to vote in this next election. Mm -hmm. So their question is to ask, what, in your opinion, what can high schoolers do to change gun policy uh, as it regards school safety when yeah. they feel like they don't have a voice? Yeah. Well, I'll start by saying they have a very powerful voice. And we saw that um, most recently with the, the kids at Parkland mm -hmm. who organized, and I would ask that they take a look at how those kids did it as an example of what they can do. Um, and it is basically demanding that they're adults. You know, we talk about our children. I talk with our children about their adults and what our children need to tell their adults to do. And on this, it's about their voice being heard, our, our young leaders' voices being heard in a way that policy will reflect their priorities. Because the thing that you know in talking with them, the thing I know talking with our kids, do you know the number of young people, and, for, and many of you have children or, or young leaders who are here, the number of children starting elementary school in America who sit in a classroom and then at school that day have to go through a drill mm -hmm. That's good. where they are taught about how they should hide in a closet in the event that there is a mass shooter roaming the hallways of their school. Maya, my sister, was telling me about she saw some elementary school students who are being taught about safety in the event of a mass shooter, and they're learning specific rhymes about how to be quiet so you don't get shot. The level of trauma this is creating in our children, who are supposed to sit in a classroom and be able to learn and daydream about the wonderful things that kids daydream about, but then come back to the focus on what the teacher is teaching and, 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 and being excited about the wonders of the world. But instead, the number of our children who are sitting in classrooms, fearing there may be a gunman roaming the hallways of their school. And, and the fact is that when those children come home and they're at the dinner table that night, and the parents are saying, darling, how was your day? And the children respond, it wasn't such a good day. Why? Well, we had to have this drill. And that conversation then goes on. Why, mommy and daddy, did we have to have that drill? And of course, the response that we all know is, well, it's because there are supposed leaders in Washington, DC, who have failed to have the courage to reject a false choice, which suggests you're either in favor of the Second Amendment or you want to take everyone's guns away. Supposed leaders who have failed to have the courage to agree, fine if you want to go hunting. But we need reasonable gun safety laws in this country, including universal background checks and a renewal of the assault weapons ban. Yep. this topic, just to be honest with you, because I've been dealing with it back since I was DA. I was elected in 2003, since I was Attorney General two terms, starting in 2010 when I was elected. I'm, I'm just fed up with it. And so I'm going to tell you guys what I'm prepared to do. When elected president, I'm going to give the United States Congress 100 days to put a bill on my desk that is about reasonable gun safety laws, and if they fail, I am prepared to take executive action to do the following. One, to put in place what will be the most comprehensive national policy on background checks, which is to require that anyone who sells 
More than five guns a year, they are required to do a background check on the people they sell the gun to. I am required also, and I'm with, to, to require also, that the AFT, alcohol, firearms, tobacco, that they are going to be required to take the licenses from gun dealers that violate the law. And be clear about this, 90% of the guns that are used in crime are sold by just 5% of the gun dealers. We need to take those licenses. I am also prepared to close the boyfriend-girlfriend loophole, which basically is that if a domestic violence abuser is married to the victim, then they are prohibited from owning or possessing a gun, but not if they're in a dating relationship. I'm prepared to close that loophole, so married or not, that offender will be dis prohibited from owning or possessing a gun. And I am prepared by executive order to ban the importation of assault weapons into our country. But our young leaders and our students, and in particular high school students, their voice is so powerful on this. And I think that we have to require supposed adult leaders to look in the mirror on this one and understand that it is unconscionable that we are allowing the children of America to grow up in this state of legitimate fear. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. So one is on the, the, in terms of the gender pay gap, which, as you know, 80 cents as compared to 61 cents as compared to 53 cents and 58 cents. So that's one. Um, the other is we've got to realize that um, there is, the issue of access to wealth is a very big part of this. And that's about access to small business loans. One of the greatest um, drivers of economic growth in particular for families of color is entrepreneurial pursuits, small businesses. And so it is my intention to run the United States government, and in particular what we're doing with the Small Business Administration, in a way that we are putting particular focus on affordable loans to small businesses in terms of investing in communities and their potential for growth, economic growth for those families and for the communities. There is another piece of it, and I will say as a proud graduate, as you've heard from Howard University and an HBCU graduate, that um, there is an incredible resource that we have in our HBCUs, many of which are in South Carolina. And what we need to do around investment in those HBCUs, understanding that they are a pipeline, a very direct pipeline to most of the professions, and we actually should be doing a lot more to maximize the potential of our HBCUs. And then finally, it is also about discrimination and what there needs to be around enforcement. And again, that's why, and that's the, the lens through which I come at our, our, the, the equity gap and pay equity gap around gender. Like, we need to just start enforcing some stuff. Like, the bad actors just need to be held accountable. And that's how I think about it also in terms of the Department of Labor and what we should be doing to enforce all of the laws that are currently on the books about discrimination in the workplace based on gender and based on race, of which there are many that are not being enforced. And then finally, it is also about understanding the connection between wealth and education. Um, when we look at the fact, that's part of my teacher pay initiative, when we look at the fact that right now in America, if a black child before the end of third grade has had a black teacher, they are 13% more likely to go to college. Wow. If that black child by the end of third grade has had two black teachers, there's something like 26% more likely to go to college. These connections exist. And so there also has to be, well, you know, and we have to understand the connections, what we need to do to focus on what we are doing in our educational systems around encouraging and keeping and retaining and maximizing the potential of all the children of our community. 
And um, so there are many ways that I think about it, but you're absolutely right. It's a very real issue. And of course, I didn't even get into, because we could be here all afternoon, the historical basis for these inequities, which we must never forget and always must discuss, because it, is, it, it, it didn't just happen this way. I'm trying to, okay. yeah, trying to, our, our trying to get us moving yeah. so that um, so that the senator can meet everybody or as many people as yes, possible like and then still make it to the town hall in time. <laughs> <laughs> Later on in Greenville. Thank you so much.